And from human trade to animal trade, poaching in fact. You know, South Africa has been forced to actually sell some of its wildlife. It's moved around 100 rhino to neighbouring countries and into private reserves just to protect them from poachers. And with good reason, the illegal wildlife trade is estimated to be worth around $150 billion a year, so says the United Nations Environment Programme. Rhino horn is actually more valuable than gold and platinum. A kilo of the stuff can cost $65,000. It's popular in Asia, where it's used in some medicines. It has a legal market too. South Africa, for example, has 25 tonnes of rhino horn from animals that die naturally and from legal hunts. It's valued at $1.6 billion. Over the border in Zimbabwe, there's something similar going on. Endangered elephants are being rounded up to be sold overseas. Of course, Zimbabwe's had money problems for years, leaving, among other things, its national parks deprived of cash. So selling the elephants could provide the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Authority with much-needed resources to pay for roads and water. But we've also got the story of Nepal, which is actually a good case study of a country that's had some success in tackling the poaching problem. Sabina Shrestha has this from Kathmandu. Up until a decade ago, these forests were the hunting grounds for wildlife poachers. Greater one-horn rhinos were killed regularly, and by the year 2005, only 372 remained in Nepal. The king of the jungle, the Royal Bengal tiger, was hunted down to a mere 95 two decades ago. But today there are over 198 tigers and 534 rhinos, and Nepal has become the only country to achieve zero poaching. More than 7,000 soldiers patrol these forests. Uh, we, we make a point that uh, boots on the ground, which is a very, very important in our case. Therefore, most of the time our troops are patrolling the area. We even go by foot patrolling, boat patrolling, even cycle patrolling, which has been very, very, very effective. While the soldiers are visible behind the scenes, the Central Investigation Bureau of Nepal Police has been active. They say that the arrest of a number of kingpins in the past few years has made wildlife traders cautious to operate in Nepal. Ours is a unique team, both nationally and internationally. The commitment from army chiefs and battalion commanders and Nepal Police's Central Investigation Bureau in curbing wildlife crime has been exceptional. The government recently decided to double the amount to spend on habitat conservation and anti-poaching mechanism. In the past, not only was Enforcement Week, Nepal was also an important smuggling route for wildlife paths between India and China, where there is high demand for traditional medicines based on animal parts. Unless we bring the concerned government into this business, then whatever effort we put in like controlling poaching, that doesn't work. In 2010, we were able to have a MOU between government of China and government of Nepal. How to address uh, wildlife crimes uh, that exist uh, at the border areas. But despite their successes, the authorities say they must remain vigilant because the demand for animal parts is still strong and prices are high. Right, so we're going to discuss some of those issues now with the chairman of the Private Rhino Owners Association in South Africa. Pelham Jones is in our uh, Johannesburg studio. Pelham, kind of a broad question to start with, but why is there still such a problem of rhino poaching in South Africa? What is, to your mind, the issue which really drives it? Well, it's a situation of an illegal demand, and the uh, approach towards South Africa has been coming a long time. We have seen how African countries to the north of us have been plagued by poaching um, because of this very, very strong illegal demand for a product um, which is sought after in the, in the Far East. So we have over time seen large populations, and we estimate some over 100,000 rhino have been poached across the face of Africa from Kenya coming right down to... Uh, Namibia, Swaziland, etc. Mm -hmm. So we were the last bastion of large uh, rhino populations, and I think we were perceived by the criminals as being a tough target uh, until they realized that they were, in fact, able to enter our reserves with a certain degree of impunity and have uh, now subsequently killed some 4,000 rhinos since they started their slaughter in 2008. You talked about, I guess, the external demand there. Uh, for the rhino horn. Tell me about the internal problems, you know, the parks, the rangers, are they outgunned, are they outnumbered, are they 
are well equipped enough. What are the internal issues that you think South Africa faces here? Well, again, if you look back to 2008, which was really when the onslaught, or I refer to the tsunami, began, we were, I think, caught with our pants down. Uh, we did not anticipate the level of, of onslaught, the intensity of it, nor the aggression. Certainly since then, we have played catch-up. Um, our anti-poaching units are operating on para paramilitary basis. We are utilizing some of the most sophisticated military technology um, available today. A lot of equipment that has been used in, in, in some of the war zones. Um, we are applying that, but sadly the sheer quantum um, and the vast areas of remote wilderness that are required to be protected, we do not have the ability to, to stop them. So in other words, in summary, more of the same technology is not working. We saw, you know, despite hundreds of millions of dollars being spent in um, anti-poaching operations, Can Kenya, Tanzania, um, and so it carries on, sadly, it has not stopped the slaughter. So we are saying that we have to look at a change in strategy. One solution I've read about here is the idea, and uh, we talked about it before, of selling rhinos to overseas buyers and, and to private safari parks who are perhaps better equipped to deal with the issue of protection. Is that a solution or is that more of a stopgap measure? Legalized trade is not the single, single uh, uh, fix-it solution. Um, it, it, it is a possibility to be considered but to be applied in conjunction with a number of other activities. For example, education amongst the consumer uh, communities of the, the Far East, better law enforcement, better political intervention, and so it carries on. If one analyzes, so what is this onslaught costing us? Our calculations are that it is running at some 1.4 billion rands a year. That is what it is costing state uh, uh, reserves provincial reserves as well as private reserves. Now the private reserves have to bear these expenses independently. Now we, we own some 25%, 27% of the national population. That's in excess of 5,000 rhino. Mm -hmm. Now we are not getting any level of assistance from any quarter. So the net result is that many reserves have now lost their rhino populations or the owners have simply thrown in the towel. Just a quick final thought from you, Pelham, uh, about the levels of, and, and, you've, and you've mentioned this a little bit, but I want a little bit more detail now, uh, about the funding for national parks and for, for anti-poaching schemes. I'm talking government funding here. Is there enough? Is there enough interest in funding this to actually make a difference? Well, in terms of the situation within South Africa, um, there has been incredible assistance um, from members of, of society, uh, corporates, etc. But sadly, it comes nowhere near to the current operating expense of some 1.4 billion rand. We certainly would look to assistance from uh, foreign uh, nationals, foreign corporations to, to, to assist in, in, in this conservation uh, on, onslaught because in many areas we do not have enough manpower, we do not have enough boots um, in the felt as we refer to, and, and we are quite severely under-resourced. And this of course is played, playing into the um, advantage of the, of the poachers who have uh, a high degree of sophistication, they've got good communication abilities, they have good getaway um, abilities, and they have good, intelli and good, good intelligence capabilities. So from our side, we are under-resourced from a policing point, and we are under-resourced in terms of a field protection aspect. Pelham Joan, very interesting to get your thoughts on this issue. Thank you for joining us today.